Good morning, good afternoon. Hello, thank you all for joining us today. I'm uh, Raymond Karam, the Chief Program and Development Officer here at AGSIW. Uh, we're very pleased to be hosting this virtual launch event uh, for Dr. Athel Yates's book, The Evolution of the Armed Forces of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, coincidentally, today marks a special occasion for the UAE uh, as the Emirates Mars Hope Mission uh, probe is slated to enter Mars's orbit in the next hour or during uh, the next hour. We wish all our friends and colleagues in the UAE the best of luck uh, on this very delicate mission. And back to our program today, I'd like to welcome our speakers, uh, starting with the book author, Dr. Ethel Yates. Dr. Yates uh, teaches at the Institute for International and Civil Security at the Khalifa University in Abu Dhabi, which offers a master's degree for Emirati security professionals. He teaches civil security, covering professional security practice, internal security, and disaster management. His current research is on the security services of the United Arab Emirates. Welcome, Dr. Yates. I'd also like to welcome Dr. Kenneth Pollock, a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, where he works on Middle Eastern political military affairs, focusing on Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and the Gulf countries. He's the author of 10 books, including Armies of Sand, The Past, Present, and Future of Arab Military Effectiveness. Uh, I should also mention a paper he published in October of last year, uh, Sizing Up Little Sparta, Understanding the UAE Military Effectiveness, which you can find on AEI's website. Uh, last but not least, uh, my colleague Emma Soubrier, a visiting scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute. Uh, her research focuses on the stra security strategies and foreign policies of the countries of the Gulf Cooperation Council, particularly the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia, and the political economy of arms trade in the Gulf. Moderating the session today is Hussein Abish, a senior resident scholar at AGSIW, uh, also a weekly columnist for Bloomberg and the National UAE. Uh, my usual discla disclaimer before we start, uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website uh, approximately by tomorrow. Uh, also a reminder to our audience, you are in listen-only mode, uh, but you will be able to ask your questions um, using the Q&A function in Zoom, uh, or you can also email us at info at, at uh, AGSIW.org or tag us on Twitter at Gulf States Inst. Um, I should also mention that the book publisher is offering a special 35% discount for our audience today. I will share the link uh, and information in the chat with those of you who would like to take advantage of this offer. And with that, Hussein, over to you. Thank you very much, Raymond, and welcome everybody to another AGSIW webinar. We're really honored uh, to have this panel today. We've got a very important and timely topic, which is the evolution, the role, and the future of the military forces of the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and I think the timeliness uh, of this conversation is reflected in the amount of interest that we've had in what, you know, a couple of years ago probably would have been a more, much more esoteric uh, conversation. And I'm really pleased that we've got uh, a decent percentage of people who've written uh, at length on this topic in recent years in English uh, on this uh, precisely on this panel and, and a couple of others uh, in our audience as well. So that's kind of remarkable. And um, I'd just like to uh, thank everybody for joining us and uh, say we're in for a real treat. So here's what we're going to do. Since Dr. Yates, uh, and this isn't really his first long work on the UAE military, he's, he's a specialist in that, has just published in December uh, what amounts to the first really in-depth book-length history of the UAE military and its evolution, which is, uh, as you'll discover, complex, interesting, very um, uh, revealing about the way the UAE has managed to come together as, as a uh, federation uh, from disparate roots. Uh, this book is extremely important, The Evolution of the Armed Forces of the United Arab Emirates. It was published in, in December, and as Raymond was telling you, you can get uh, a discount uh, today from the publisher. It's, it's a great book. I've, I've read it, and uh, it's just absolutely terrific. And then we'll turn to uh, Ken Pollock, who did a really terrific paper, uh, as always, in uh, October. Right. So the, the end of last year was a really good time for this topic uh, called Sizing Up Little Sparta, which is an evaluation of the UAE's present 
military effectiveness, right? It's a little different, obviously, and rather shorter, but it's a very in-depth paper. It's, a, it's a more than 50 pages long, and it's uh, there on AEI's website, and there's a useful executive summary and all of that. So I, I, I thought that was just a terrific work. I, I did a kind of baby uh, pamphlet on this myself a few years ago for AGSIW that was a, a kind of a half-baked effort in this direction, but now really... Uh, you know, better informed people have done it better, which is wonderful. Uh, and then uh, we'll bring in Emma Soubrier, who is really a specialist in um, both uh, military aspects of the Gulf policies and their relations with, with Europe and others, and also the whole issue of human security, as we keep talking about in the Gulf. So let's begin uh, with Dr. Yates, and uh, let's, let's ask him to explain sort of describe the work that went into the evolution of the armed forces of the UAE, this, this new book that he has, and to tell us about his findings and, and uh, what's in your book. Uh, if you could give us a, a description, that would be just great. Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak here. And it's delighted to see on the panel so many people who've worked on this topic, but also in our audience. I know we've got lots of members of the former um, militaries that had op have operated in the UAE over the last uh, 60 years. Now, my work um, is only could have only been possible through the support of my university. Um, Raymond, may I have the slides up, please? And uh, they have been extremely uh, uh, supportive in allowing me to do my interviews, my archival research, but I've also used, uh, and I'm very grateful for the support I've got from my students who've sh shared insights into how the, the system here works. And that's been really important to understand, um, to provide the context for this. And I'm very grateful for the ed my editor, Alaric Seal, who I couldn't have done this without him. <laughs> Next. So uh, Hussain's asked me, what's the book about? Well, um, what the book is about is really a scholarly history of the military of the Emirates. Now, you notice the word I'm saying, the military of the Emirates, militaries of the Emirates. That's because there's been quite a few militaries here. There was one major British milit controlled military. There's been something like um, seven locally controlled or ruler controlled militaries. There's been one pre uh, federation, sorry, pre-unification military that was federally controlled. And then when in 1976, they mostly joined together to form the UAE Armed Forces. That unification has continued on into the late 90s when the force was fully unified and fully integrated. So the history of it is quite complex. So what it covers from the very early days to the uh, current situation. So what I've got up there is a couple of pictures that illustrate from the, one of the very early militaries, the uh, ruler-controlled military, the Abu Dhabi Defence Force, and this is the uh, origins of special forces today. That was the first group that was established, uh, the uh, Desert Wolves. And what you're looking in the bottom picture is uh, quite a modern picture of a um, multi-command uh, exercise uh, from 2018. It's important to say what the book isn't about. So it's not a policy book. It doesn't argue for recommendations, nor is it a critique on the military and its use and its operations. The, what the, the book's intention was is to provide a reliable history and a comprehensive history at that so that others can draw on facts and build upon them for their policy work. That was not this book's aim. May I have the next slide? So people ask, why have I written a book about the UAE military? So I started this uh, over seven years ago. And the reason was, is because there was a lack of accurate and comprehensive history. I needed this because I'm teaching um, at the Institute of International and Civil Security. So we teach Emiratis. And when I came here in uh, 2012, all of the curriculum was American. There was no local context to it, no local history. So we had to start documenting this and I've used our students to help do this. 
So the reason for the, hi the history in the first place was to provide fill a need for my students. Over time, it's, um, it's, it became a work that's tried to understand how is it that the UAE has been able to go from a, 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 a state that was pretty undeveloped, uh, subsistence even some may describe it in the early 60s to today where they've got a highly capable military. Now, during the, the journey of writing this book, I was surprised at the number of myths and misconceptions about the military. And the book tackles a number of these. And you'll see, you'll see these continually repeated in, in the media. So I'll give you a couple of examples. One is that the uh, National Service, which was introduced in 2014, was introduced as a way of building up the military in, in preparation for the operations in Yemen, which came a year later. Well, that's absolutely untrue. It was totally related to building a, a part of the project to build a national identity, national cohesion. Another myth that you hear all the time is that the UAE Armed Forces is full of expatriate soldiers. Look, this was true up until the late 90s. Uh, but by that stage, they had virtually removed the uh, officer corps, uh, sorry, expatriates from the officer corps and from the um, uh, soldiery. And since then, we've had only handfuls of expatriates who have served in uniform. Um, however, there has been large numbers of contractors who have served in there. So that sort of makes people think, oh, the military's full of uh, expatriates, absolutely not true, and it hasn't been now for two decades. Another rumour that comes up all the time is, or allegation, is that the UAE Armed Forces employs large numbers of mercenaries, defined as people who wear the, wear the UAE Armed Forces, sorry, who don't wear the uniform and are not party, or not one of the parties to the war. Again, this is not true, and it's arisen because there's been a lot of confusion over the a common tactic that's used by the UA, US and the UAE and all the other modern militaries, which is the training, advise, assist a type approach to raise local forces um, and the use of contractors. And sometimes it is difficult to understand the difference between contractors and formal military personnel. Next slide. So Hussein's asked me what's the, the key themes of the book. So I'm gonna give you three that I think is really important. So the first one is an understanding of the context that an armed forces is the product of the environment. And in the terms of the environment, we're talking about the geography, geopolitics, political systems, culture, and so on. If you cannot understand this, you cannot understand what's driven the nation. And I just wanna give you, a sorry, not the driven the military evolution. And I wanna give you a couple of examples to do with the geopolitical environment. This map shows it very well. What you, look, what you can see is that the UAE is a comparatively small country surrounded by a couple of large players. And you chuck in Iraq uh, as well. You can see it's not a particularly, um, it's not an environment where they're on parity with other, with other states. So due to, this shapes significantly the evolution of the military. So take in the 1960s, where there was a priority to, to deter land incursions, which explains the early force development emphasis, which was on having a mobile infantry that was not supported by land forces in the forms of artillery or, or tanks because they didn't have the technical ability, but in the form of aerial artillery. That was hunter ground attack aircraft. In the 1980s, in the middle of the Iraq-Iran war, where both sides uh, was threatening the UAE and did attack the UAE at different points, they prioritised air defence. Land forces were somewhat neglected. So my point there is you need to understand the geopolitics as part of the uh, understanding of the military. Next slide. Okay, another dimension to understand the military is the in is the political system, okay? So unlike many militaries in the Middle East, 
the UAE Armed Forces is, has never been a power centre in its own right. It hasn't run factories. It hasn't had a major, it's it never been a major political actor. It's always been under civilian control. And that control has been vested uh, over time in the various rulers and the heads, the, the structure the rulers have generally adopted is to appoint the crown prince as the political head of the military. And then you would have a professional head. Though sometimes if they were small, they'd have one and the same person. Now, culturally, government organisations in the UAE are very responsible, very, very responsive to the instructions of the rulers. And this applies equally to the military. So this explains why when the ruler focuses on a particular area via his crown prince, then that area radically changes. And so you want to see a good example of that, which is related to this picture. So in 1982, beginning of the Iraq-Iran war, the UAE Navy had extremely poor, uh, limited capabilities. The archives at the time showed that it was not effective in any way. The few vessels they had, the officers generally would protest about going out to sea after two o'clock because that was knockoff time. So Sheikh Zayed was not particularly enamoured with this, so he appointed this chap, Brigadier Hamid, uh, Al Kuwaiti, who's the chap beside me, and he was promoted to the first part, to be the first Emirati to command the UAE Navy. He had no naval background, but what he was able to do because of his relationship with the leader, the respect that, that the system has for the rulers, was that he was able to drive very uh, rapid. At radical improvements. And within six months, you actually started to see uh, the naval forces being able to uh, operate at sea 24 hours a day. Um, now, I also put up this picture because it shows uh, we went and did an interview with um, the commander and I brought along some former and current students because it's really important to engage these guys in the interviewing process, building their knowledges, because it's the locals who are going to be the historians of the future, not people like me. Next slide. Another real important theme that's often missed is that the UAE Armed Forces has historically supported the country's foreign policy. Now, people are saying, oh, the UAE military's uh, involvement in Yemen shows a expeditionary capability and a willingness now to use the military for foreign policy purposes. Well, this is not true. This has always been the case. And the very first instance I can find of the military being used to support the country's foreign policy was when Sheikh Zayed offered Qatar the opportunity to send its personnel to the UAE to, to join the Navy and build up their naval forces. What, what I've inserted there is an illustration of all the different examples where the across the soft power to hard power spectrum where the UAE military has contributed uh, at different times. And I've just chucked in a couple of examples, an old example where the UAE in 1983 gave its, all, its old hawker hunters to Somalia as part of its uh, foreign policy efforts to help stabilise and build the country. And then obviously the picture up the top is about Yemen. Next slide. Okay, the next theme is that the history of the UAE armed forces in the Emirates from 51 to 60 is extremely complex and the evolution is non-linear. So it comes with spurts. And um, Hussein, if you would like to post that link now, please. Um, I'm going to show you in a minute what the evolution looks like, but don't fear, I'm not going to go through this. I put this picture in at the very first, um, that the, 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 the is a great picture of the very early the first of the militaries in the Emirates, which in this case was the precursor of the Trucial Amman Scouts called the Trucial Amman Levies and the land forces of uh, the Royal Air Force, which was the forces that worked with Sheikh Zayed to uh, protect the Bahraini Oasis uh, back in the early 50s. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide, please. So what you're looking at now is a, the uh, line diagram that illustrates how the militaries of the Emirates have evolved. 
And so uh, let me, can I interrupt you for a second, Dr. Yates? Uh, let me just tell all our participants, you can, you can access this in our chat function. I have put up a link. Everyone can get it. All the attendees can access it. You can pull it up and, and see it more clearly as Dr. Yates now walks us through this graph. Go ahead, please. Okay, so I'm not going to go through any of the details, but I just draw you to the colours. That's all you need to know. So the, the, the colours designate different sorts of forces that have existed in the militaries. So the red is the British military forces that existed here. So there was red, regular military forces and locally raised British-led forces, the Truce Lamar Scouts and Levies. The green is ruler-controlled forces. So these are the militaries that were offered, uh, were direct controlled by the individual rulers of the Emirates. And I mentioned at the beginning, uh, there was uh, roughly six of them. Uh, depends how you count them. So the, the, the green ones. From Abu Dhabi, which had the biggest, to Umul Quain's National Guard, which was the smallest. The, light, the, the brown is the UAE Armed Forces. So they were formed in 1976 with the unification of all the other forces together. And that has evolved since then. And what you're looking at there is just the major combat commands that exist today. It's Navy Command, um, uh, Critical Infrastructure and Coastal Protection Authority, etc. And the light blue is the federal military that existed before 1976. Okay, So it's quite a complex uh, history. Okay, next slide, please. And the last theme that I, uh, the book addresses, uh, which is how has the UAE armed um, forces, become, sorry, how has the UAE been able to build such a capable force in the, sh in the short time? Now, Hussein's only given me 12 minutes and I've used them all up and I know that this is the focus of uh, uh, Kenneth Pollack's brilliant work. And so I'll now hand over to him and I'll look forward to questions after Emma's finished as well. That was a great summary, and thanks for sticking to the 12 minutes. I really appreciate it. But we'll have plenty more time to uh, pick your brain and find out more about your work, which is you know, so impressive. Uh, Dr. Pollock, I'd like to bring you in again uh, to refer to your uh, AEI paper from October, Sizing Up Little Sparta, Understanding UAE Military Effectiveness. Um, can you tell us about that and also... In the context of Dr. Yates's work, uh, I, I'm interested in where you see any overlap and what you found as well. Sure, absolutely. Uh, first, Hussein, Doug, thank you very much for having me. Always a pleasure to be with AGSIW, such a class act, and uh, such a, a great pleasure to be on this panel and to celebrate the work of, uh, of Dr. Yates. The book is terrific. I have also read it. Um, it's outstanding. Uh, very, very quickly, I'm going to use a minute to just say a couple of words about Dr. Yates in the book. Uh, first, I think many on this call do know him, but for those who don't, um, Athel Yates is the expert's expert on the armed forces of the UAE. He's our secret weapon. Uh, when I started writing that paper, um, I thought I knew a fair amount about the armed forces of the UAE until I started to have conversations with Dr. Yates and I realized that like Jon Snow, I knew nothing. And his help was absolutely invaluable and uh, he has forgotten more about the armed forces of the UA than I or I think any of us will ever know. Um, which brings me to the book, which is also sensational because now all of you have some, some snippet of the wisdom that he has gathered over the years, right? And it is, it's an extraordinary book. And where I want to start to talk about it and the themes that you asked me to talk about is I want to thought, start with his first theme because that's where I wanted to start talking about why this is such a terrific book. And I will simply say, you know, I was delighted to see that that was his first theme today. When I picked up the book and I opened to, or I was looking at the PDF, of course, but I saw that first chapter and the first subheading was geography. And I thought, I am going to love this book, right? Because exactly that reason, you cannot understand the military history, the evolution, the development of any armed force without understanding the society from which it grows out of and in which it inhabits. 
when I teach, whether it's German military history or British or Iraqi or Iranian, I also always start with geography and topography and dem demographics. Right? And this book is absolutely superb on that. And exactly the way that Dr. Yates described in his, his brief presentation, talking about bringing in the political developments and the economic developments and culture, society, it's critically important. Right? And it's something that Western military history has done a very bad job with. Over the years, milita Western military history is typically focused on events and battles and how this battle shaped the this battle and, and things. Are, and it's not unimportant, right? It's actually very, very important. And Dr. Yates has all of that in this book as well. But there is this added dimension that's absolutely critical. Right. And it has absolutely informed my work on Arab militaries over the years. It was a main driving element of that paper of sizing up little Sparta, because if you're trying to understand why it is that the Emirates have succeeded, why they have done quite a bit better than any other, any other Arab armed force over the year, you have to ask the question, why is it that they have been able to make something grow in what has actually been fairly barren soil right, for so many years, I'm speaking figuratively, I guess I could be speaking literally, but I'm speaking figuratively. Why have they been able to have something grow that's been so much stronger, so much bigger, so much more capable where so many others have failed? I wanna say uh, a couple of words on that and on the future. First, exactly as Dr. Yates pointed out, you know, what's really fascinating about the Emirati Armed Forces has been how this political leadership has looked at the capabilities that actually existed and then thought in an extremely intelligent and an extremely strategic way about how do we build greater capability. And what we've seen from them over the decades, and this is in my work, but it is also in Dr. Yates's book, is how they have very systematically figured out, okay, every single thing that they could do to squeeze greater military effectiveness, greater efficiency, greater competence out of the force as it has existed. And over the time, building on layer upon layer upon layer. And as a result, they have now a small force that in some ways is highly, highly capable. As I point out in my paper repeatedly, the Emirates can do things that NATO members cannot do, right? Not the United States, not Great Britain, not Germany, not France, right? But, you know, there are things that the Emirates can do that the Belgians cannot possibly do, that the Dutch cannot possibly do, right? Most NATO members cannot do many of the things that the Emirates can. And the Emirates have demonstrated they can send a small force to a place like Yemen and have it perform quite well in combat. And that that is a, a level of capability that, I said that no other Arab force has ever demonstrated. The real question mark is the future. Right. And again, one of the great values of this book is how it creates a foundation for people to start thinking about where the Emirati Armed Forces are going to go. And that's where I want to finish my remarks, because, again, I think that the book is critically important, because when you think about the future of a military, right, militaries, they're like the proverbial aircraft carrier, right? They don't turn quickly, even if things change dramatically. Militaries are big institutions. They always turn slowly. And so you have to understand how they grew, how they evolved over time to understand which way they're going to turn and how fast they're able to. And understanding where a military came from and its development over time is particularly important in two different situ situations. One, where the leadership is requesting change, where the leadership wants to make changes, and two, where warfare is changing. And both of those things are going on right now. As Dr. Yates points out in the book, the strategic circumstances of the Emirates are changing dramatically. And I'm hoping that Emma will talk about this a little bit more. The United States is disengaging from the Middle East. We are not going to be there and be as protective as we have been, no matter what all of us on the screen may wish, right? That is simply the reality. And the Emirates has recognized this, and they are trying in some very smart and sophisticated ways to figure out how to better handle their security. One of them is to better develop their own military forces. The other thing, as I mentioned, is warfare is changing. Now, warfare is always evolving. But sometimes it evolves much faster than at other points in time, right? Between 1870 and 1914, the evolution of warfare was much, much faster 
than I would argue it was between say 1940 and 1990. We're in another one of those periods. Drones, cyber warfare, brilliant sensors, brilliant uh, weaponry, uh, massive data battle management programs, all of this is fundamentally changing the nature of warfare. And all of the militaries of the world are struggling with this, right? And you've got lots of military experts out there just saying, well, this is the best practice, so this is what all the militaries are gonna do. No, right? I can guarantee you that's not going to be the case. Every military, when faced with change, its first question is, how do I fit this into whatever it is I already like to do, right? And that's why it is so critical to understand where armed forces came from as they try, as they struggle to integrate changes in technology, right? UAE, like every military, and the UAE better than most, is now struggling with these dramatic changes, both in its strategic situation and its missions, and with these changes in warfare. And if you want to have some sense of where they may go in the future, you must start with Dr. Yates's book. You must start with understanding how they got to where they are today. Right. That's I completely agree with everything you said about Dr. Yates and his work. Uh, he is the secret weapon. Yeah, that's right. And I had the same experience. I thought, oh, I more or less know about this. And then I met him. <laughs> I had the same. So I felt like a kindergartner, uh, which is great because, you know, obviously uh, I, I didn't. And that was wonderful. Uh, so this is a perfect segue uh, into Emma, who's done a lot of work um, on the evolving nature of the of the approach to national security uh, in Gulf states, strategic diversification in particular, which is exactly the, the, the overall, the umbrella, part of the umbrella response to the conundrum that Dr. Pollock was talking about, and also uh, an, an emerging model of human security beyond simply national security. So um, I'd love to get your take on both Dr. Yates and Dr. Pollock uh, comments. And also, by the way, all the attendees can now access also a link to Dr. Pollock's paper uh, on the UAE military in, in, our, um, in our chat function. So uh, Emma, go right ahead. Thank you so much, Hossein. Uh, it is an honor to be here. Um, Dr. Yates, thank you so much for a rich and much needed volume on the armed forces of the UAE, uh, extremely well documented and thorough. As you mentioned in the preface, less than a decade ago, there was, I quote you, an almost complete lack of useful information on the UAE armed forces. Uh, when I started my PhD back in 2012 also, uh, Victor Javis uh, thesis on the transformation of the position and role of the armed forces in the UAE helped me a lot. And there has been a number of great papers written on this, this topic since, including the brilliant work of Ken Pollock. Uh, but your monograph is without a doubt filling a gap in the literature and breaking forth uh, crucial issues. It was particularly exciting to discover the third part of the book, uh, providing a comprehensive history of the armed forces of the Emirates. And I hope that it will open avenues for others to further investigate this from different angles. Um, there are many other valuable parts and interesting perspectives throughout the book, particularly the meticulous uh, discussions of available statistics and estimates we can create from them when it comes to the evolving manpower of the armed forces of the UAE, as well as the percentage of foreigners within the ranks and the military burden, to name a few. Um, one of the features of the book that I really appreciated and enjoyed was the looking forward part at the end of each chapter, tying everything nicely, inviting the reader to keep in mind what the emerging challenges might be in several areas. In part one, for instance, the chapter on the physical environment, which I also, I was so exciting to see, excited to see that it was the first part, uh, ends with the mention of the risk of being drawn into escalating tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran, but from a geographic perspective. Uh, and the one on people and culture concludes that uh, it is highly likely that the current emphasis in the UAE on countering political Islam will continue. Um, part two of the book is the one that I have personally been the most interested in uh, given my research focus. 
uh, it describes in a clear and relevant way the core missions of the armed forces, uh, namely defending territorial integrity and sovereignty, but also protecting the rulers and their families, bolstering internal security, nation building, and you named it, supporting foreign policy. Uh, and it sets out to discuss several issues as they relate to the equipment and manpower of the armed forces. This part is also unsurprisingly perhaps the one that I found the most thought provoking. Um, among several topics uh, that I hope that we can cover throughout our conversation today, I would be particularly interested in, in discussing some of your speculations in the looking forward movements of this part two. For instance, uh, I would like to come back on your idea that and can actually mention that it is likely that the UAE's reliance on the US will decline for three main reasons. A perceived reduction in the level of interest in the Middle East by the US, the US lack of thoughtfulness in and commitment to its own policy decisions, and the US inconsistent approach to providing advanced military systems and munitions to allies. Um, could you expand a little bit on this and how do you assess this theory in light of what can see uh, of the new US administration? Uh, and there's another proposition you offer at the end of the chapter on equipment that I found slightly puzzling uh, as as defense expenditure invariably increases in time of insecurity, and this will be the situation in the UAE's region for a foreseeable future, it is logical to expect that the current substantial level of spending on defense will continue. Uh, so my, my take on this is that given what 2020 showed of the importance of human insecurities, largely overshadowing any other kind of insecurity, and given the toll the pandemic had on budgets and probably also on military expenditure, um, I would posit that this assumption can certainly be challenged, but I would love to hear you on this. Um, and in the first chapter of part two, I would also love to hear or read more on the indirect ways these missions are reached through the politics of arms trades, uh, for instance, as well as the entire dynamics that are up at play in the important military burden that you demonstrate, for example. Um, so yeah, I have a couple of other points that I'll be happy to come back to later, but I wanted in any case to thank you again for such an important volume and uh, that's it out of me for now. Thank you. That's great. And it, it helps to set us up for our conversation. So we're, we're going to uh, continue the conversation among the panelists for a little bit, maybe 10, 15 minutes, something like that. And then we'll invite um, questions from the audience and, and sort of uh, broaden the aperture a bit that way. But those are three pretty broad questions for you from Emma, Dr. Yates. So I'll leave it to you, um, which you want to address and in what order, uh, but it's put a lot on the table. So I'll just turn it right back over to you. And if you had any, any uh, thoughts about what Dr. Pollock said also, that's fine. So it's up to you. Thank you very much. And thank you for that, that fulsome um, response. But I do have to caveat, I recognize there's some weaknesses in this. So a authentic Emirati voice is lacking from it. Um, the use of uh, primary sources related to the Arabic mili uh, UAE, sorry, the military uh, records in Arabic and also there is a weakness in that a, it does not reflect large scale interviews of Arabic, Emirati, Arabic, Pakistani uh, voices that have been absolutely central to the earlier parts of the history for it. So it's, it's very much could be improved and I'm hoping that uh, through further research over the next decade, I'll be able to bring out a second edition that does rectify a lot of those uh, weaknesses for it. Also too, I can I say it's not my work, I'm just building on the work of uh, giants before me. So people like Ken Pollock's, the, the book Army of Sands, uh, 
other works that have been on uh, that, that have been out there for numbers of years has been really important to help me develop my thinking or the importance of understanding culture in understanding why decisions get made. Um, Emma's raised uh, a couple of issues about the looking forward component. So that was insisted by the editor. Um, so the original draft didn't have any of that because my speciality, um, what I feel most comfortable is simply being a, a historian documenting it using primary resource, primary sources. Uh, and looking forward, obviously, is speculation, not my, not my area. Uh, but there's a couple of things you raised that I think is worth discussing. So one of them is this idea of a rentier state. I know this is really a popular um, paradigm I'm not convinced at all it even exists here. I think it's something that a lot of others will use to explain it because that works in their culture, but I don't think it really does exist here. Um, the issue of will military spending continue to grow? So you, Emma's identified that, uh, I, that there was around five key purposes of the militaries. And one of those is nation building and foreign policy um, as being two of those. Well, the, you've got to put the context in the fact that the military is partly a social organisation as well as a military organisation. It's an arm of government, not just a military. Uh, and it's quite important uh, in terms of the number, that the, the employment that it offers. I'm not saying that there's a lot of, um, what do you call it, uh, surplus resources in there or at a, at a sheltered workshop. That's not what I'm meaning at all. But it is, it, it's historically been used as a key tool for developing the nation through bring, drawing in people from all the Emirates into one organisation, giving them education, uh, getting them to think rationally, to develop those basic skills that modern society like uh, needs, you know, technology competency, project management, and so on. So see the military in that context. Uh, I think that's really important to understand why I think the expenditure will continue. Now, there's some, some significant changes underway in the organisation of the military here, and that possibly will see some... Uh, um, fundamental changes, and like you would expect every so often, a military needs a radical change. All militaries in all histories end up with top-heavy force structures. Yep, cut off the generals, yeah, every country. So I would expect that to be the case. Um, also, too, you're not going to, you haven't seen yet what you see in a lot of other states where there's been an outsourcing or a commercialisation of a lot of those non-core military functions like guarding. Um, and that may also occur, but uh, and that may have an impact on um, the expenditure on it. Um, there's general widespread support of the military as well, which you need to take into account. So while other countries are saying, well, how about we spend more on hospitals and spend, and spend less on the military, that's not really a dynamic in the UAE. The, the social uh, welfare of society here is, is social safety net is very good from a uh, perspective of my, both locals and expatriates uh, here. And it's not like you haven't got, a, if you take put money into the military, you'll put money into, you're taking money, money away from uh, hospitals. That's not the case. You just got to look at the vaccination system uh, uh, rollout here. I had my second vaccination back in December the 4th. Now many, and I'm not even in the high risk group. So it's pretty impressive that the um, social support systems here. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Well, I've and got a, I've got a technical question for you. Um, you talk about the primary sources, and I'm just wondering from the point of view of, of the researcher, what sort of archives, military archives, are available in the UAE to scholars? Uh, and, uh, you know, to, to what extent is it, is it 
possible without enormous difficulty to access uh, the, these primary sources, uh, especially in terms of the, the, the archives of the UAE since independence. Okay, so we have a national archive here that uh, government, all agencies uh, have a deposit material in. Now, some of that material is uh, accessible, some of it's not. It's a very hit and miss sort of system so far. The military material goes into the military archives. I haven't been able to access that at the moment. Uh, however, others have been able to obtain certain things that I've required on my behalf through official, through official mechanisms. Um, I've also used a lot of grey literature, uh, things like the um, uh, soldier magazine uh, in Arabic that dates back to the beginning of the Federation. Mm. Uh, there's also been quite a lot of um, 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 materials that are not documentary materials, but have been very important to documenting certain things. So photos are a great example, maps, um, uh, Christmas cards, you, you, unbelievable. So the, U, the Abu Dhabi Defence Force used to put out Christmas cards. Sure. And these are great because they have pictures and of equipment, and then you'll have uh, details of what is in that Christmas card. And so that helps me uh, locate um, when bits of equipment came in or what forces were in at what time. Uh, interviews have been very important, but you've got to treat these with caution. And unless they're supported through um, other documentary evidence, principally photos or some secondary materials I can access. Now, possibly the best uh, source of archives around at the moment is the, this, um, the material that's been put on the net by uh, Qatar, which is all of the, much of the documents up from the Indian um, office. So that's up to, what, about 48? Mm -hmm. Yep, wonderful material, which allows me to uh, to be writing the history of the military in the second, sorry, of, of the uh, Emirates in World War II. And that's I don't think there, there was much, but it was a key um, logistics point in Second World War. Right. Um, the other key uh, source of... Uh, archival material, another uh, is online, is called the, uh, I think it's Abu Dha, no, no, the Arabian Gulf Archives, mm. right, with brilliant digital source, it's yeah. again mostly British material, yeah. uh, but you can pick up also archival material, uh, odd collections of it at things like the ECSSR, which has an excellent library called the Foundation Library, um, and, and other, uh, uh, and of course, there's also some small military and, and police, uh, archi sorry, museums yeah. around, which also has good material. Uh, the ECSSR is the Diplomatic Academy in the uh, no. UAE, no? No, no, that's the uh, ECSSR stands yeah. for Emirates, this is a Emirates Center for uh, strategic research. Okay, the strategic from, research, right. Not the diplomatic academy. That's not the diplomatic, okay. I think I spoke with them both at the same day and I got them confused. All right, but well, that's good. Um, right, so that's very, very helpful and thank you. Great answer. Um, lots of stuff to work with, um, especially from the past in English. But uh, Dr. Pollock, you, you wanted to um, add something, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Emma, I, I was struck at first. You know, I, so many of the things that you said resonated with me as well. But I was struck by the fact that you pulled a quote from Ethel's book, mm -hmm. which I had also pulled, right? And was also kind of thinking, oh, this is an important topic. Um, and that was your, your the, the line from Ethel's book that I'm um, looking forward, it's likely the UAE reliance on the US will decline for three main reasons. And, and Ethel lays out, I think that was just a hugely important point. Um, and I think it's, a, it's an important point I, I was thought I might kind of throw some of my own thoughts, but that we could also comment on a little bit more, because I think for our audience and for this topic of the role of the UAE military in the geostrategic environment of the Middle East now and going forward, this is a huge question, 
right? And I will just start my own thoughts on it that, you know, one of the things that's been striking to me is that particularly over the last couple of years, in particular, since the Iranian attacks on uh, Gulf oil exports in the summer and fall of 2019, right? It's not that was the first time, but that was really the kind of the, 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 the straw that broke the camel's back or the tipping point where I think that a lot of the Gulf states suddenly realized the U.S. really is disengaging. Right. It's something they've known, they had known, they saw it under Obama, it got worse under Trump, but boy, when Trump wouldn't do anything, here was a direct challenge to the Carter Doctrine and its Reagan corollary, and the Iranians were getting more and more blatant, and then, my God, they attack Abkik, right, the beating heart of the global economy, and the U.S. does nothing, right? And so clearly, this is a major challenge, and what's been striking to me is as I talk to the leaderships in all the different Gulf states, for most of the Gulf states, there is anger and frustration and confusion, right? They recognize they are going to have to do something differently. They are not going to be able to just rely on the United States or before that the United Kingdom, as Ethel points out in his book, as they had done for 75 or 100 years, but they don't know what comes next. The Emirati leadership, and again, I think it's really nicely reflected in Athel's book, the Emirati leadership seems to be the one that's doing best. And it's not, I, I don't think that they have a full answer either. Exactly the way that that quote that Emma and I both pointed to points out. I don't think they have a full answer yet. It's going to be something that's going to take them a while to figure out. But I feel like, first of all, they've got part of a good answer in that, okay, we have to be a lot more self-reliant, right? And we're now seeing the Saudis, the Qataris also coming around and saying, maybe we have to take our military more seriously too. But that's part of an answer. In addition, I just see the Emirates trying to think in a much more systematic and strategic fashion about how some of those other elements might fit in. So again, Abel's book nicely talks about, and I know Emma's work has as well, about China, Russia, right? And I think that you know, there's a lot of fear in the United States that, oh my God, we're going to leave the region and everybody else is going to jump on board with the Russians or the Chinese. I think that's less likely, and I hear it from all the Gulf states, but again, I, I see it most, I think, thoughtfully from the Emirates, who will say, look, you know, the Russians don't share the same interests that we have. In some ways, their interests are fundamentally opposed to ours. The Chinese, well, they share our interests, but they don't have the military power of the United States, and they won't for at least 5, 10, or 15 years. And beyond that, the Chinese tend to be really transactional. Right. What the Americans and the British got that the Chinese don't is that you need to have these long term relationships where you give some now in order to get some later on. Right. So I don't think that those furnish complete answers either. And I said, I think to my mind, I, I'm going to watch where the Emirates goes on this question as we move ahead, because I just think that they're being much more systematic and thoughtful, exactly the way that uh, that Apple's book uh, intimates, right, about how they're going to come up with answers to what is now the great strategic question facing them. Hey, those are my thoughts, but I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. I, I, I'd love to also hear from Emma as well. I mean, I think the Chinese could learn from the Turks a little bit, though they, they lack the heft. They they lack the power, but they're very good. They have that same, you know, kind of how to use sticky power to, to draw people um, from the ground up to them, uh, where they've where they've gotten engaged in Africa and in, in parts of the Arab world. Um, uh, I'd love to hear Emma's response uh, to you. And just a quick note to the audience, because I got uh, this note, and I think it's worth saying, I've been referring to Dr. Yates and Dr. Pollock in their, by their titles, and Emma by her first name, not because of gender, but because we work together. And so I call Ambassador Suleiman Doug, and I call Emma Emma, and I call Raymond Raymond, and they all call me Hussein. Uh, so she's in the family, and uh, Dr. Pollock and Dr. Yates are our guests. It's nothing to do with gender. So Emma, go right ahead. Thank you, Hussein. Um, thank you so much for these uh, comments, Ken. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Pollock. It's uh, it's really uh, it's, it's Ken. We're all family. <laughs> it is. Uh, I I I yeah. I I was uh, I was also very happy to see that we we took that pretty much the same that same uh, quote from the book. I think it's it's extremely important, and and I concur to you most of what you just said. Uh, I would say though that this whole idea that the U.S. is disengaging 
is sometimes misleading to me because I, uh, and maybe that's because I'm a European, but I didn't feel like the US was disengaging from Gulf affairs uh, under the Trump administration, if only because of the maximum pressure campaign on Iran. Like that is not what I would call disengaging from, you know, regional affairs. Um, and I point to that because I think it was extremely important. I, I concur that there was no direct, they, there was eventually a reaction from the US um, to the Apkeik attacks, but also previous attacks that you mentioned. Um, I think that it is quite interesting to see precisely what the, the reaction of regional powers in the Arabian Peninsula was at that moment. There was a, indeed a reaction of disbelief to the lack of reaction on the US part. Although I think it, it was very telling to see that in the summer of 2019, the UAE and Iran were having discussions, if only on to, in terms of maritime security. And after the attack, um, there was this, this realization that the US was not going to intervene in military. Uh, I would argue personally that uh, some of the regional states, at least, including the UAE precisely, uh, would not have liked the US to react uh, too strongly at that moment. And that this lack of reaction with an added... Um, uh, with an, an, an added uh, action from the European powers to kind of de-escalate everything that was happening in the region, which was really uh, appreciated by the regional powers, including for, first and foremost, the UAE, um, led to what could have been the opening of a, of a chapter of de-escalation. And as we know before, the, the, um, the, the targeting of uh, General Soleimani, there, there was uh, discussions uh, between the Saudis and Iran, discussions that uh, both Saudis and Iranians are now calling for again. I, there was a very interesting op-ed very recently on the necessity for regional powers to start engaging each other, not in, uh, in arms race and, um, you know, escalation of if, if not attacks, at least words, uh, that maybe they need to re-engage in diplomacy, which is, which is precisely why I, uh, I threw that question of, well, where, where do you see everything now, uh, Dr. Yates, especially with the new US administration that hints, that, that hints at another way to go about regional affairs, meaning, Still not disengaging, but engaging in uh, in diplomacy rather than selling more weapons and and fueling the maximum pressure campaign and this this rhetoric of having really a threat uh, a, a threat to contain and 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 pretty much going about regional affairs through this lens only. My sense, by the way, is that um, the region is kind of going that way anyway, perforce, mainly because all these proxy wars are stalemated. Uh, and I think in most cases, the, the um, patrons have maxed out what they can achieve on the ground in the past couple of years. And there's, there's conciliation and, and retrenchment going on all over the place, in my view. But I'd like, with your permission, just because of the time, uh, and we'll begin with you, Dr. Yates, so you can respond to any of this, but I'd like to start throwing in questions from the audience or we'll never ever get to them because the panel is so good. Um, let's begin with one from Charles Forrester. And, and again, please feel free to respond to uh, anything else. We've seen the use of expeditionary forces, i.e. C-17A, to support the UAE's soft power objectives. Uh, how do we see the whole panel? The UAE's capabilities expanding further in pursuit of a greater soft power presence, more expeditionary sea lift assets, greater information warfare capabilities, or what? So we'll begin with Dr. Yates, and then I'm sure um, everyone else would like to say something. I want to pick, first pick up, before I answer that question, the issue Ken and Demma has raised about this disengagement. You need to think about this in historical context. What's happening now with the US is just like Britain faced in 71. So 
1971, there was a military withdrawal. And that meant no longer was Britain being provided the external defence of the countries of the lower Gulf. Now, Britain made it perfectly clear we are not leaving the region, particularly we have other interests here and we will support you. Uh, but of course, it was characterised as a withdrawal. Now, just like America is today, pretty cranky about the, or mystified, I should say, about um, this, the, the um, engagement with other partners rather than it being the first. Uh, exactly back in 71, the British couldn't understand why are they, uh, the Emiratis dealing with the French and buying a lot of equipment from them and building up their political relations with them because we've been their historic partner and the Germans and so on. Well, you've got to understand from the, uh, their perspective, well, firstly, the Emiratis and the leadership we're talking about here in particular, Sheikh Zayed and others, did not believe that Britain was respecting the relationship, the personal relationship, and they started not trust them. Now, I think we've seen that over the last uh, second, you know, decade plus in the, with the US as well. The other thing is that Britain, uh, and to some degree America is doing the same, is a very paternalist, has a very paternalistic approach. And you see that with if Britain used to say, we'll tell you what weapons you can have. You can't tell us which weapons you want. Now, of course, after you have this occur to you, you look around to other partners for it. And so we're seeing now the same occurring with the, um, with the US. And I think it's just a natural phenomena because of a series of, um, what would you say, relationship changes and not appreciating or recognising the, the, that the UAE is a sovereign state and needs to be treated as that. And it is a significant state now in shaping the region as well. So you need to respect that. Uh, I'll, regarding the actual question, I'll hand over to, to Emma and Keats to answer that. Uh, okay, well then uh, let's go then uh, to Nimrod Novik, who asks uh, an interesting, albeit predictable question, and you know already what it is because it's <laughs> Nimrod. <laughs> Does the UAE's normalization with Israel fit into this conversation, and if so, how? And that's a really good, I mean, I think the answer is, oh, hell yes, but um, still, uh, the answer is how. Any of you want to begin that um, Please do. I'm glad to start on this one because yeah, I think please. that it does it, it it dovetails beautifully with the issue that Athelema and I have all been talking about, and, and of course you've written about this as saying very eloquently as always. But you know this is part of the answer to that conundrum. I mean, again, am I, I take your point that. Uh, Disengagement, uh, look, the U.S. always does everything in a kind of uh, push me, pull you, stop and go fashion, right? And right. Uh, Trump simultaneously, you know, walks away from the Middle East in every way except one, right? He's going to do maximum pressure against Iran, which, of course, makes no sense with all the other things that he's not doing. But that was the inimitable Donald Trump. Um Nevertheless, I will say, again, even though our forces haven't changed very significantly, people are talking about drawing down our forces. But more importantly, it's just that the United States isn't getting involved in regional affairs the way that it once did, right? We no longer feel it necessary to solve the security problems of the region the way it once did. And I agree with you, Ethel. This is absolutely uh, almost carbon copy of what we saw from with the British during the, the post-war period. And I, I wish we would learn from that history. It's another reason why people need to read your book, right, is to actually learn how to do it better. But anyway, what I see on the part of so many of the, the uh, Sunni Arab states, if I can use that term, is they're asking this question, to what extent can the Israelis become a substitute for the United States? Um, as I like to put it very glibly, if you can't have the great Satan, maybe you can have the little Satan, right? Um, and certainly Israel has some very formidable capabilities. And of course, uh, one thing I think that many of the states of the region also like is the Israelis are willing to use their capabilities far more 
frequently than the United States is. But I still think that that you know, raises some very important strategic issues, both for the Gulf and for Israel. In particular, you know, just to put it into kind of uh, political science, terms, you've got a problem of extended deterrence, right? If the Israelis are going to deter an attack on Iran, it is harder for them than it was for us. Israel, while incredibly capable, doesn't have our capabilities. Iran is longer, farther away for them than it is actually for us. And Iran has ways to retaliate against Israel directly that they don't have to employ against the United States, right? And so that creates some conundrums. And what I hear from the more thoughtful Gulf leaders is we like the alliance with the Israelis. We think that that will be helpful in deterring Iran. But, you know, we are nervous that if we get into a crisis, the Israelis aren't going to trade Haifa for Abu Dhabi. Definitely not. Um, let me, before uh, bringing back uh, Dr. Yates into this, uh, let me just say, I mean, the, the most obvious issue is that the Gulf region is dominated by the Gulf itself, by the waters of the Gulf. And there is no maritime power on earth that can substitute for the fifth fleet. That's it. Uh, either it's there or it's not there. Uh, there really is not uh, a substitute available, let alone can it come. So, and certainly not from Israel, but nor from Russia nor China nor anything. It's that's it. It's either that or nothing. So, um, Dr. Yates, could you address this question as well? And and um, I'm sure Emma has some views as well. So the the question is the importance of Israel. I'll only address it in terms of the UAE armed forces mm -hmm. and. Uh, I think that there are certain capabilities that the UAE armed um, forces would like to obtain from Israel um, and build on their already existing uh, relationship, military relationship that predates it. Now, that is historically, traditionally, yeah, for the last decade or so, been in hardware, sorry, in physical items. It's not military exchanges. It's not joint planning or whatever it is. So I think that it is, it is important in that. But I'm not sure that it's a game changer in any great way. Um, one of the things that if the US withdraws, you want to have some sort of balancing arrangements or at the very least some sort of bandwagoning going on to fill a vacuum and you know, drawing those into this region may be one way of doing that. Emma, do you have a... Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, what I was thinking of and listening to, to Ken and Ethel, uh, I, um, I think that it's, it's interesting because, the, for instance, you take the normalization with Israel. The UAE definitely has a lot that it can gain from it and it did uh it did look into you know the 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 some sort of cooperation when it comes to defense industry not just buying some equipment from israel and as dr yates uh, pointed out the uae is certainly interested in some of uh the 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 equipment that israel could provide and and they've been you know they they've been buying from israel before no, the the normalization agreements but it, it certainly makes things uh, a lot easier now that it's out in the open, uh, not just in terms of buying, uh, purchasing equipment from Israel, but also possibly down the road uh, having some technical cooperation that could help the, the burgeoning uh, defense industry in the UAE that is thought of, uh, that is thought as, as a way to, to empower themselves um, and, and move away from too much dependence from their traditional suppliers. Uh, and it also, as, as has been mentioned, serves their foreign policy objectives. Um, I would also, I, I think it's really important to look at the official, uh, official speeches that have been given in the UAE about these agreements and to really put forward that every, at every occasion they had a chance to do it, the UAE leaders reminded that the, the normalization uh, agreement with Israel were not directed at Iran. And I do not think that it's pure rhetoric. I think we need to see this as a sign of how the UAE actually perceives those agreements. 
for everything that it brings in terms of tourism, once again, in terms of technical cooperation, in not only in military terms, that's that's kind of the, the other topic that I that I look at a lot in terms of addressing human security issues, uh, public health security, um, most importantly. Um, but I, I would I would say that um, you know I pointed at when I think it's it's the very the very first chapter, Dr. Yates, you underline the risk for the way to be dragged on into or or, or brought brought into a possible escalation of tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran. I would I would posit that that is a risk. Uh, to be too closely associated with Israel uh, right now in terms of escalating tensions. We've seen the Israeli reactions to, uh, to the, the new U.S. administration wanting to, to uh, wa walk towards more diplomacy with Iran and the reactions in Israel are not, uh, they're not very much welcoming uh, these, these, um, these uh, move towards more diplomacy and less uh, aggressive stance, stances. So, so I would say that it's kind of a double-edged sword for the UAE, this association with Israel. It can bring a lot, uh, but they also, and we've seen that in these features, they need to have a very careful balancing act mm -hmm. with their new official partner. Right. I mean, I, I think that's obviously true. Uh, can I throw out one observation on this subject? Uh, the UAE and Israel, in fact, face analogous security concerns when it comes to both strategic diversification and the way in which they not only perceive risks, more or less the same, they see Iran very similarly, they see the Muslim Brotherhood in Turkey and Qatar very similarly, they, they look at the Middle East similarly. But in addition, these are two countries with relatively small populations, although Israel is much larger, yet it still has not got the ability to, um, you know, to field large infantries to occupy large amounts of territory for a long amount of time. It's very bogged down in just, you know, area C of the West Bank. I mean, that's, you know. Uh, and so there's this real emphasis on both sides on things like uh, missile defense, cybersecurity, electronic warfare, artificial intelligence, all that. And then they both see themselves, Israel really is, and the UAE is becoming a tech hub. So there's a commercial aspect. So there's a lot of dovetailing between these two countries. And in many ways, Israel has developed in a way the UAE would like to commercially, um, educationally, technically, and militarily. Uh, and that's because they share that, um, th those characteristics. Um, so uh, let me, uh, there are a whole set of questions I'd like to kind of bundle together for the purposes of time that have to do with the uh, potential for other GCC countries to develop in similar ways to the UAE or not, and I mean, would they even want to? And also the future of the GCC alliance and the way in which the UAE fits into it or not in, in the context of its military, both its capabilities and its uh, also evident limitations. And whoever would like to begin, feel free. Okay, so I'll start. And, uh, and I would say technically or theoretically, uh, the other smaller Gulf states could replicate the UAE's approach. And I would say the success, there's a series of success factors that has allowed the UAE to achieve what it is. And Ken Pollock in particular has been mentioning this. It's the, uh, the leadership focus on driving change. So if there's an agreement for doing that, but it also it relies on a societal structure where there is a respect and a desire to drive that change and being willing to change norms such as um, innovation, uh, pushing down responsibility to lower levels. Now, these things require the direct oversight of a leader that's well respected to do. Um, also, there has to be a considerable engagement and peer uh, and engagement from other countries so that they can learn from those experiences, but be confident enough 
to reject things that might be best practice in one country but cannot work in, in the local context for cultural or political, whatever reasons it is. So, yes, they can do it if there was a will to do it. Whether there is is a completely separate matter because it's a decision that the leadership itself has to make for it. Future of the GCC is an interesting issue and the GCC military. Well, you think back to the formation of the GCC in, uh, what, 1980, um, 81, sort of that period, um, where it primarily was established to offer some sort of collective defence, uh, at least in principle. Failed abysmally in um, uh, the goal, uh, 1990, obviously, and since then, yeah, where well, it's been marginalised, the contributions that have been provided by certain uh, members of, of, of the Peninsula Shield Force and so on has been trivial. Uh, at the best, it's all relied on Saudi Arabia in terms of numbers. So uh, what's the future of it? I think what you'll see is far more likely to be what we saw in Yemen, which was a coalition of the willing where groups will establish themselves for a particular mission uh, that will bring in outside players if they can uh, for particular requirements, uh, political and military requirements, and that will be the basis rather than the GCC itself. Uh, I think we've passed that, that period in time. Fair enough. Go right ahead. Can I go up in as well? I think these are very important points. And in particular, I wanted to, to kind of build on uh, Avil's first response about the military capabilities and say that, you know, I, at first, I think he's absolutely right that if the leadership of the other Gulf states really kind of got religion on this and were willing to take on the challenge of making a real investment in military effectiveness the way that the Emirates has, let's work for 25 years, right? This is not something that started yesterday. Um, they absolutely could get at some point, probably 25 years from now, up to about the level where the UAE is today. Mm. But the, the real key here is that, and uh, Athol's work is, uh, develops this, my work to an even greater extent develops this, it's only going to take you so far, right? And we need to recognize that what the Emirati leadership has done is to recognize, okay, in the short term, um, there's a bunch of things that we can do that's going to generate a certain amount of military power, right? And then they've done that, right? And they've done remarkably well with it. And they can probably do a little bit more, but it's going to get harder and harder for them to do so. Right. And, and they've recognized this. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why they have made the transformation of wider Emirati society their ultimate critical objective. Right? right. And it's not just because of the military. It's for a lot of different reasons. But the military is a piece of that. Right. Because you can only go so far in plucking out your best personnel and putting them into key units and creating a certain amount of military power that way. At some point, you are going to need a lot more of those capable people. And the only way that's going to happen is through this wider societal transformation. So far, only the Emirates is interested in doing that. Right. And they are doing it, you know, in, in an incredible way. And yes, there are obviously failures, but there are tremendous amounts of success. And it is slowly and it only ever happens slowly making progress. And so 25 or 30 years from now, I suspect the Emirates are going to be in a very different place altogether because of all of these changes that they're making toward the wider society, the impact that will have on the military. So far, as I said, you know, Mohammed bin Salman is flirting with the idea of making these kinds of changes in Saudi Arabia, is doing some of it, right? But nothing like the kind of systematic strategic application that has been done in the Emirates. If, you, if the other states are going to match the Emirates in that sense, they're going to have to take on that project as well. Uh, did you have any comments, Emma? I'm, I mean, I completely agree with what has just been said. Uh, I, I was going to mention that, yeah, it seems that uh, MBS to, such a, to, to a certain extent is, is trying to, to follow this, this model. Um, obviously, the, for, for obvious reasons of, of size and, and differences of population, um, it's, it's not going to be the same. But I find it interesting to, to see not only um, well the, the the topics that that I look at is um, 
uh, in terms of diversification of partners, but also trying to launch a, a local defense industry, for instance, that has been quite interesting to see uh, in Saudi Arabia. And the other point that I was going to mention is that up until I would say 2014 uh, and, and more clearly 2017, Qatar was, we could see some of the same, uh, of the same dynamics happening in Qatar with a, a potential uh, will of the leadership to, to go towards this. Uh, although what happened at the beginning of the Gulf crisis is that we really uh, witness a, 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 a revolving, a reverting back to the, the real politics of arms trade by buying the support of external pat patrons uh, in, instead of really building up uh, cap local capabilities uh, for, for the, again, quite obvious reasons. But I would say up until quite recently, there seemed that Qatar might be interested in doing the same. So now that the Gulf crisis is, uh, is being resolved, uh, we might see that again in, in Qatar. I think that will be something interesting to follow. Great. Um, so I'd like to um, take another question that really is, I think, mainly for Dr. Yates. By the way, six minutes ago, the, uh, the UAE Mars mission uh, Hope Probe entered the orbit of Mars. So they've actually pulled it off, which is not bad, uh, to say the least. And and it, it is connected to what we're talking about. It's not a military mission, but it's it's not, you know, uh, disconnected. So and, another step forward. Uh, Andrew Smith says, uh, Dr. Yates, that your book describes, and this is true, how the UAE diversified the sources of more demanding training, post-71, Pakistan, the air capabilities, Egypt training and other areas. So given the cohort nature of professional development in the militaries, is there any evidence of a potential generational change as the senior officers whose career started at those times move out to be replaced by a new guard of differently educated officers? So looking basically at turnover in the officer corps, generational. Uh, absolutely excellent question. And in the West, our generations are pretty much categorised in X and Y and da da da, right? So it's a peer, a, a age group transformation. Here, I here we have observed that the transformation is occurring geographically and with age. So you're getting certain groups of people who are in effect somewhat different from other groups. So those groups that go through, say, a Western schooling system locally, then they'll go overseas and get a, a degree from a European uh, university and come back here versus somebody who's went to sort of a local school here and then finished at uh, year 12, did their national service and came out. Radically different groups. And we've seen it in our students over the last decade that they have changed enormously. So you getting people who at the same period, they may have gone to an Egyptian staff college. Others may have gone to a French staff college. Others may have gone to, I don't know, an American staff college or where in Pakistan. And uh, they, each of them come back somewhat differently. So if you went to the American one, you might be much more familiar with mission command concepts, delegation, versus an Egyptian one, you may be more attuned to... Um, uh, I don't know, more of a prescriptive approach to, doc, to, to uh, tactics and operation rather than a doctrinal-led one. Now, that also reflects here as well. When they set up staff colleges here, you had certain influxes of certain nationalities that set them up. So uh, the National Defence College that was set up I don't know, five, seven years ago, something like that, very much American influence because I think it's an FMS case that was the basis of that. Um, other, the staff college had a much more Jordanian flavour to it when it was established, even though there was a couple of key Brits that were involved in it. Uh, so my whole point here is that there is numbers of generation changes and they're all occurring simultaneously. So it's not a particular age cohort, where they come from, where their background. And so that means you're getting these pockets of development and uh, in the military in general, uh, in Arabic militaries, but uh, this is our Kenneth's area more than mine, you seem to get 
uh, the, the key decision making maker being higher, maybe like a lieutenant colonel versus a major or captain in the, in, in the US system, a US army. Uh, they have a lot more prerogatives than here, uh, than a lieutenant colonel would here. But that's changing. While that may have been true, take, say, 10 years ago, now in some areas where you've got a very, I'll call it modern or progressive uh, leader, that's being pushed down. So, uh, and, and another pocket of capability or a unit, it'll be more traditional. So you're getting this thing happening simultaneously. And the impact when a leader leaves has a, can really have a significant change in that unit's culture as well. So cultures can rapidly change, but they can rapidly change in a more conservative manner as well as a more progressive manner. Um, we also had a question about the future of the UAE Navy. And uh, <clears throat> that's always sort of been an interesting question in the sense that it, it's um, UAE does seem to want to project power a bit, but it doesn't have anything more than catamarans, right? So um, it, what is the thinking um, on that score, if you know? Um, okay, so Emma's rightly noted uh, that... The UAE does not want to be sandwiched right. into between operations. Uh, and the reason for that is geography. You can have a highly capable military that can do very, uh, that can be very good at defence, uh, but because of the sheer small size of the country and the fact that 90% um, you know, of the populations live in a few major cities on the Arabian Gulf, it means that it is very easy to have a significant, cause significant damage to the nation. You know, that the country, 80% of all food is imported. Uh, it's, uh, de it depends on desalination plants for water, has no significant groundwaters to, to survive on. So it's a sort of precarious thing. And a, even a few shot, a few attacks that get through can have a devastating impact. So it's really important that the UAE avoids that. So uh, it's, I would argue that its, its naval capabilities is very much focusing on providing a deterrence and a tripwire yeah. uh, rather than thinking it can uh, defeat yeah. a, all of an aggressor's behaviours. Right. Simply, so logistically, tripwire just, rather than strategic depth, right? Yeah. I yeah, it. It, there is no strategic depth. No. There's, there's, there's yeah. ludicrous articles that, yeah. ludicrous articles about how the involvement in Yemen and the Horn of Africa is to give it strategic depth. Yeah, it what are you talking about? Are you got right. to move up the population and ship them all off to yeah. Somaliland? No. Yeah. No. All right. So uh, which leads us perfectly into the last set of questions that I want to throw to everybody. Um, and if either of you would like to say something about this, go right ahead. Let's, let's begin. Go ahead. Emma, you wanted to, to talk I, I about I just wanted to jump in because um, I, was, uh, I was thinking, listening to Dr. Yes about a, a passage, I think in, in your paper, Dr. Pollock, uh, on how it is, it is generally understood that the Navy, uh, not just in the UAE, but in the region, have been uh, kind of the the, the head head um, redhead child of uh, the the redheaded armpit. stepchild. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and I w I would I just wanted to add that uh, cap capability wise, uh, we've seen recently a clear objective of the UAE to to make up for that and to to focus more uh, energy and procurement in, in uh, beefing up the, the Navy and, and uh, maritime security um, missions. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so the final question, I, I have one uh, very small parting one for Dr. Yates, but, but the final concept that we're gonna close with today has to do with UAE engagement regionally and and it's it's willingness to use its military in, in limited ways uh far afield in in yemen in libya uh, some other places possibly uh 
you know, to to help its friends and punish its foes and, and exert its influence. So the, the set of questions have to do with the implications of the limitations of those policies, which I think were made quite clear in Libya, uh, you know, last year. Uh, and in addition, people have asked about the ideological component. So whatever aspect of that very complicated tangle of ideas you want to discuss, uh, please do. And uh, maybe Ken wants to begin, I think it uh, looks like he does. Sure. Thanks, Hussein. And you're right. This is a huge question. Yeah. Since the time is short, I'll just... The whole other <laughs> panel. <laughs> just focus on one piece of it, which is that, as you point out, and, and obviously Athel's book also points this out, we have seen the Emirates using its new military capabilities far afield. It's a small country. It feels vulnerable. And so obviously it wants to shape its environment to uh, ensure its own security. That creates challenges for the United States, right? It's something we have to come to grips with. For 75 years, we defended these countries, not quite 75, certainly the last 45 or so, 50 years. So, um, and as a result, we could basically tell them, you know, don't do this, don't do that, we'll take care of it. And frankly, they didn't want to, right? They were perfectly glad to have us take care of those problems. Well, we're now getting into an era where we wanna do less. And we're specifically saying to them, we want you to develop your military capabilities so that you can do things so that we don't have to. And the great challenge for us is when they decide, you know what, that is a security problem for us. And we're going to go take care of that. And the United States thinks, we don't want you doing that. We don't want you mucking around in Yemen. We don't want you mucking around in Libya. And their feeling is, no, 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 we've believed that that really does hurt us, right? And I think that the U.S. is going to have to do a lot of work recognizing that if we want allies with real military capabilities, sometimes they're going to use them in ways that we don't necessarily like, right? And we're going to have to accommodate ourselves to that. This is the conundrum of burden sharing. Either you share the burden, which means you share the decision making, or you don't share the burden and you keep the decision making, but you can't really have both, can you? Exactly. Uh, either Athol or Emma. Or Emma. Um, yeah, Emma, go ahead. Yes, uh, I'll jump in because it, it reminds me of a, a point that Dr. Yates was uh, doing earlier about the, how the armed forces have always supported the foreign policy of the UAE. And I very much agree, although I would add that the foreign policy of the UAE in the new regional and global context of the early two, two, 2010s have actually evolved because uh, what what I... I um, I argue in, in, in my work is that the, the way the region evolved with the Arab Spring represented major threats, but also represented an opportunity for the Gulf countries to swoop in and gain more power on the regional stage. So what I would argue is that what we've seen was a, a move forward in terms of uh, asserting itself as a new regional power that has to be reckoned with. And the UAE has certainly done that. And uh, I would say that the, uh, the, the agreement to sell F-35 to uh, the UAE is certainly proof of that. And um, if I had to take a wild, not so wild guess, I would say that for various reasons, be it the new administration in the United States, but also the human security challenges that I, that I underlined before, et cetera, the foreign policy of the UAE might not change, but it might see an opportunity to say, well, we have established ourselves as new regional powers. The world now knows we do not need to continue military operations the way we have uh, been doing in the past uh, few years. And we might see a, a, a little halt in this. So, uh, Dr. Yates, we'll come to you, and uh, this can be our final comment. And there is also one one tiny little question, technical question at the very end for you. But go ahead. You. Okay, I think it's wrong to characterize the UAE as wanting, is having a more activist military role, or even a more... Yeah, sorry, that, that, that's true. I think that they don't particularly want to have this role there in shaping the environment, what they would prefer is a stable environment as it was in the past and get on with what they want to do, which is develop the country, which is make a happier place uh, that is able to trade and be attractive to, to tourists and all the rest of the things. It, it has sort of been forced in this because of the absence of all the other players and the instability in the region. 
Um, Michael Knight has done some brilliant work uh, when he was an, embedded in the um, UAE and forces in Yemen. And you look at that, what he was writing about and how the UAE has been drawn into Yemen right from the beginning, never really had an, a strategic objective to get involved in the way it had played out. Uh, and I think that's important to understand. Um, their competence results in them being drawn into these things. They've also, I think, had a, a, a hard learning, like all, many other countries have, when they've gone down the train, advise and assist mission and helping local forces. Yeah, it sounds good on paper, but in reality, it's problematic at the, at the best of it. Now, the question was also about ideology. Now, this is, not particular, this is not related to the UAE armed forces, but what I want to recommend to all of the listeners, this book that has just come out in English called The Nation State. And it's written by uh, Dr. Ali Rashid al Nawaini, who is a, a outspoken and uh, I would say thought leader when it comes to the issue of political Islam and what the agenda is. Now, I'm not critiquing it, I'm simply saying, if you want to understand what's driving it, the logic behind it, read his book. It's absolutely tremendous. That's called The National State. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. The, the final uh, question is, and we had this from several people, and it's a great question. When is your book going to be available in electronic form and how can they download? Because people often now like to read not just hard copy, which you can get, uh, but, you know, uh, electronic Kindle and e EPUB uh, versions and stuff like that. Do you know? You might not know. I do not know. And it's, uh, as I understand it, the publisher doesn't do electronic yeah. publishing at the moment. Yeah. And so that's something if you want it, you need to lobby him to okay. put it out electronically. So send an email to the publisher. That's great. Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate your time. Uh, Dr. Yates, congratulations on your book. I agree with my two colleagues here that it's just fantastic. It really, it, it is the book that needed to be written and you've done a superb job. And it's going, to be, it. it's going to be the standard text on a really important issue for a long, long time to come. Uh, can you uh, set the standard for everything uh, with armies of sand? So, I mean, that's that's the overview text that you know goes uh, everybody goes to. And uh, Emma, it's always great to be with you. So, thanks very much to everybody for joining us, and we'll do another webinar extremely soon. Thank you very much.